these are the ones who, living in the flesh, planted the church with their blood. They drank the chalice of the Lord and became the friends of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. So today we celebrate the great solemnity of the feast of the two pillars of the church, St. Peter and St. Paul. And um, we're going to talk about their particular vocations because they're given to us today as a model of showing these two different aspects of the faith, this, this Petrine, this Pauline call of evangelization, which is different and has different, uh, different roles for priest and laity. Today is also the day of the um, anniversary of my, of my dad's first homily. So my dad was a deacon in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., so he was ordained yesterday, 12 years ago, and uh, I remember him giving, giving a homily on this day in my parish. Um, he's a good preacher, so I can say like that song, I am a son of a preacher, man. Um, and it's, it's beautiful to just see um, the way that he uh, lives his ministry of the word as a deacon. So we can pray especially for, for all deacons who are called particularly to that, that, that Pauline call of proclaiming the gospel in season and out of season. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Came to call sinners, Christ in mercy. Christ. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord of Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord, and you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who on the solemnity of the Apostles Peter and Paul, give us the noble and holy joy of this day. Grant, we pray, that your church May in all things follow the teaching of those through whom she received the beginnings of right religion. For our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the Act of the Apostles. In those days, King Herod laid hands upon some members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by the sword. And when he saw that this was pleasing to the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He had him taken into custody and put him in prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. He intended to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter thus was being kept in prison 
but prayer by the church was fervently being made for God on his behalf. On the very night before, the, before Harold was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door guard kept watch on the prison. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord stood by them, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrist. The angel said to him, Put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. So he followed him out, not realizing that what was happening through the angels was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second, and came to the iron gate leading out the city, which opened for them by itself then emerged and made their way down an alley, and suddenly the angel left them. Then Peter recovered his senses and said, Now I know for certain that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. The word of the Lord. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the love and the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together exalt his name. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered and delivered me from all my fears. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not be blushed with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. The angels of the Lord escape and camps around those who fear him and delivers them. Taste and see how good, how good the Lord is. Blessed the man who takes refuge in him. The angels of the Lord will rescue those who fear him. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. I, Paul, am, a, am already being poured out like a libation, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have competed well. I had finished the race. I had kept my faith. From now on, the crown of righteousness awaits me, which the Lord, the just judge, will aware a word a word to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have launched for his appearance. The Lord stood by me and gave me this gave me strength so that through me the proclamation might be completed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue, rescue me from every evil threat and will bring me safe to his heavenly kingdom. To him the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
the word of the Lord. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Christ. Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. So I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. So we have these two pillars of the church, Peter Paul. And the Lord gives us this not as a feast day, but as a solemnity, because of how important they are. The very importance of Rome is because these two men found themselves in Rome, preached the gospel there in their final days, and died there. And because their blood was spilled there, that's where, in a sense, that call of Peter and Paul start and go out to the world. Peter we see especially in that call of uh, the Holy Father, which we see that institution in our gospel today, in which the Lord changes Peter's name, says, yes, you are Simon, but I will call you Peter. Peter, which means rock. And that word rock is, it's little rock built on the big rock. So it's not that Jesus is sort of pushing himself aside, but he's saying, I am still the king, that you are my prime minister. And there's this image from the Old Testament, which has the prime minister, the steward, the one who speaks in the name of the king, the king is away off in battle or on campaign, and that steward would have a giant key that would be on his shoulder, and it would be that key that opens the door to the gates and closes the gates. Now, he doesn't do that on his own authority, but he does that through Christ. And so even in the scriptures, we see this 
this institution of the or the institution of the papacy, and to see that it is a gift from God, that it is a gift that we can hold on to, it gives us a sure anchor. And the gift aspect we see in both the gospel, but also in the in the first reading, the fact that Peter doesn't use his own wits to get out of prison. You notice the whole time he's just kind of in a dream. He doesn't really even know what's going on. And it's only after he gets out that it says he comes to his senses and he says, wow, the angel of the Lord helped me through this. And there's a sign in that where the Lord wants to remind us that what the Lord does to the papacy is not necessarily dependent on just the human ability of that man, or even the personal holiness of that man. If, if we think about human, or just the history of the church, we know that in the midst of the, the, the papal office, there are many saints and sinners. We would be blind not to be able to see that. If you look during the Renaissance time, if you look during these times, there's some pretty rough times in the personal holiness of, of the papacy. And yet, the gift is always there. The gift of saying, I will still keep my church solid on this rock of the office of the papacy. And that's why we have to be very, very careful in the midst of a time in which, I think we see this in social media sometimes, we go too far even sometimes different criticisms of our current Holy Father, even Cardinal Sarah, who has mentioned, you know, he maybe has some differences in, in maybe ways of going about things, and yet he says to speak in this way against the Holy Father is to be outside of the church. And so he has this beautiful intention there of saying, yes, we can work like Peter and Paul, where there are some times where even Paul is called to, um, to speak to Peter. If you remember that part in Galatians, in which Peter has to, has to grow in that, you know, in that particular witness. But notice how it's not jumping out of the church or attacking in a way that is unhealthy. And I, I think I've seen this even with Catholic bloggers a way in which they step too far. So we have to be very, very careful. Are we truly trusting that God is God? Or are we putting our own human categories, saying, I know better than the church, and I know better than God's plan for the papacy. So I just encourage us to be careful of that to recognize that God made a promise to secure the church on the papacy as that point of unity, regardless of the person's personal holiness or not. But I think we also have to look and see the beautiful witness that our current Holy Father gives in that sense of being someone who really tries to live out that gospel of mercy that way in which there is this, um, and Sherry Waddell, someone who um, does a lot with um, intentional discipleship, speaks about Pope Francis very, very likely having a charism of mercy, which that charism of mercy is when you see suffering and when you see pain, there is something in the heart that hurts for the hurts of others and just goes right out. And I think that's where you see this very natural impulse as, you know, he's going through a procession or he's doing something like that. He sees someone in need and all of a sudden he just stops everything. He just goes over there and he just embraces that person. I think there's a beautiful witness there for us to see in that call of being led by mercy. So I just, I give that to you in this time of a difficult divisive climate within our church to be very careful how social media can form our minds to become very impulsive and sort of swing this way or this way and not have time to really discern, to pray.
pray, and to ultimately trust God. There's too much of a gut reaction, I think, in our society as a whole, but then also in our church as well. So be careful of that, and make sure that you're rooted in prayer, rooted in Christ, and rooted in a deep love of our church. So now, these two calls, the Petrine and the Pauline, Petrine, Peter, was called to be the one who is to be that point of unity within the church, to be that place in which he ministered primarily to the Jews, to those who were already in the midst of that covenant. That was his call. And for most of that time, he was in Jerusalem. He also went to, to Antioch. He found himself in Rome. But his main call was being that strengthening within the life of the church. Paul's call was to be a missionary to the Gentiles, to go out, to go into those areas where no missionary has gone before, to go to those particular limits, as Pope Francis would say, the peripheries, to be able to go there and bring the gospel there. And if you think about it, both of them did different things like that. So it's not like one's this way and one's this way. There is that both and. Paul was a nurturer of his communities that he founded. So he also worked on the internal growth of the church. Peter ultimately found himself preaching in the midst of Rome. So they both did both. But there is a way in which we can learn these different roles particularly of the, the, the clergy and the laity. And this is something um, Bishop Robert Barron in the Word on Fire Institute, I'm a, I'm a member of that Word on Fire Institute, and I really, I really like a lot of the, the sort of way of bringing the gospel in that particular way of truth, goodness, and beauty. But one of the things that he points out is he said, sometimes we ask the question, many times maybe when we're mad about something, mad about um, something in the church, and our kind of first thing is, bishops, what are you going to do about it? And Bishop Robert Barron kind of points out, saying, yes, there, there needs to be growth there, there needs to be courageous preaching there, and guiding the people, but sometimes that's the wrong question to ask, because a lot of times we sort of put it out here, but we don't kind of ask the question, what am I going to do about it? Because he, he points out that there's two different calls within the ordained ministry and the laity, and they can interlap at different times, so it's not a polarization. But the primary call of the ordained ministry is the sanctification of the people of God, leading them to the sacraments, helping them grow in holiness, helping them become missionary disciples so that they become the ones that go out into society as doctors, as politicians, as lawyers, as you know, different calls of, of, of promoting the social teaching of the church, people on the front lines. Sometimes there's a way in which there's a certain passivity of saying, Father, what are you going to do about it? And that's actually a recipe of disaster because then you sort of send the one priest out or the one bishop out to, in a sense, be leavened for the world, and they collapse, where they're not very effective. Because in many ways, they might not have the expertises that many of the laity have for particular spheres of influence. And so it's, it's important to see that call of really kind of going deep into the heart and saying, Lord, you have entrusted me with different experiences, different education, different strengths, different charisms. How am I called to be fed here? How am I called to be nurtured by the ordained ministry so that I can go out? So that I can go to those places like St. Paul, those places that the priest could never get into in the same way that you can. This is actually the call of Vatican II. 
Vatican II was not to set laity versus clergy or clergy versus laity. It was to say there are different calls, different roles, but if we truly learn, if the priesthood truly learned how to live this out, you know, and sometimes I would say, as priests, sometimes we struggle with that. We can become more the Toastmaster versus the one who leads people into a deep worship and encounter with the sacraments. So that's something that we need to pray for, is the overall holiness and purification of the priesthood to really fall in love with the sacraments on such a deep way, to fall in love with hunger to give God's mercy and confession, to fall in love with the Lord on their knees in adoration. So we need to pray for that, but we also need to pray for the mobilization of the, the laity to be able to not be afraid, but to say, the Lord has filled me with his spirit, and I'm fed here, but I'm called to go out there and be the, the hands and feet of Christ in the midst of society. Wherever the Lord has called you, whether that's in the arts, whether that's in the media, whether that's in law and state and all these different things, we need to have Catholics who are properly formed. I think one of the problems that we've had in the past is we've had maybe Catholics going out into some of those areas, especially the political sphere, and not being properly formed. And it becomes a disaster and a horrible witness. We need to be fed here, nourished here by the teaching of the church, and then empowered to go out. Peter and Paul, working together. So ask the Lord, how am I called to be Paul going out? And now let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. As we celebrate the great apostles Peter and Paul, we come forward as church to offer prayers to our Heavenly Father. For our Pope, successor to Peter, may the Lord continue to protect and preserve him as he leads our Holy Church. Let us praise the Lord. Lord for world leaders, may the Holy Spirit grant them fortitude in their work for peace and justice. Let us praise the Lord. Lord for all who are persecuted for the sake of the Gospel, May they receive the strength, courage, and grace that they need. Let us praise the Lord. Lord For all who worship here this day, may the light of Christ illumine any darkness we carry and guide us in our daily lives. Let us praise the Lord. Lord For our faithful departed, may they receive the crown of righteousness in the eternal kingdom of heaven especially for the repose of the soul of Tim McCollum, for whom I am next to offer this Mass. Let us praise the Lord. Lord we pray for all the intentions within Our Lady's intercessory box. We pray also that through the intercession of Saints Peter and Paul, that we might be able to go deep within our vocation to bring Christ into those 
those fears of our society and bring leaven there. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and the blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Loving God, hear the prayers of your church. Grant them according to your will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the prayer of the Apostles, O Lord, accompany the sacrificial gift that we present to your name for consecration, that may, that, and may their intercession make us devoted to you in celebration of the sacrifice through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for by your providence the blessed apostles Peter and Paul bring us joy. Peter, foremost in confessing faith, Paul, its outstanding preacher, Peter, who established the early church from the remnant of Israel, Paul, master and teacher of the Gentiles that you call. And so, each in a different way, gathered together the one family of Christ, and revered together throughout the world, they share one martyr's crown. And therefore, with all the angels and saints, we praise you, as without end, we Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Venis Vulgenia Terra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in Excelsis, Benedictus, Vitanit in Domine Domini, Hosanna in Excelsis. 
you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that He bless these, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church, and be pleased to grant you peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, and together with your servant, Francis our Pope, and Richard our Administrator. And all those holding to the truth and on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God living in truth. In communion with those whose memory you venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, blessed Joseph, your spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul and Andrew, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers and all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation, and counted among the flock of those who have chosen. Be pleased, O oh God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect, make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread and his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Stir the faith, we proclaim the gentle and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate, therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven, Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, Offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, Holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation of the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, 
may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants, who have gone before us with the sign of faith, and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, to all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who are those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, Graciously grant some share of fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with light, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. said to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church.
Jesus, O Lord, who have been renewed by the sacrament, so to live in the church, that persevering and breaking of the bread and the teaching of the apostles may be one heart and one soul, may be steadfast in your love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So this evening we start evening adoration hours. So from Monday through Thursday, from 6.30 to 7.30. on one of those days, I have to kind of figure out my schedule, um, possibly Tuesday, I can be available for evening confessions as well, because not everyone's able to come, um, you know, right after, right after Mass at this time, so I'll, I'll let you know more about that, but um, uh, I encourage you to just come before the Lord, allow the Lord to just feed you with His Eucharistic grace and mercy, because all of that does is really prepare your heart to become more and more of that which you receive. Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of 